welcome to Sean White's Solar and Energy Stores podcast. Today, we are going to talk to Jeff Max, and he is the CEO of Ascent Solar Technologies, otherwise known on the stock market ticker as ASTI. Jeff is a turnaround CEO, and we're going to find out what that means, serial tech entrepreneur and investor. In over 30 years, he has founded, built, and incubated different global companies with multiple exits and financial services, payments, mobile commerce, ad tech, and aerospace. Jeff is driving the company's global positioning as a leader in flexible thin film solar technologies. In addition to several board positions, Jeff advises and mentors a select group of portfolio companies and founding executives in aerospace, biomed, and ad tech. And so Jeff Max has been the Chief Executive Officer of Ascent Solar Technologies since October. So first of all, Jeff, I want to find out what a turnaround CEO is. Well, you do the hokey pokey and you turn yourself around. That's what it's all about. (laughs) All right. Uh, Hold on. Let me turn myself around. (laughs) No, you know, it's really an interesting sort of niche. And what it is, is, you know, when you've been doing this as long as I have, as you said, over, over 30 years, you know, you learn quite a bit about how to scale organizations, how to cut to the core of what the unique attributes and differentiators of the company are, and help refocus the organization on driving the kinds of returns that the market's looking for. In the case of Ascent, that is revenues and earnings. It's further development on a technological scale, but in other cases, it's been taking a nascent technology and bringing in the team and the scaffolding to scale that business. Yeah. One thing that I noticed just by looking at your website, it's pretty neat, is you have the flexible thin film solar. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that everybody likes to look at that flexible, thin film solar. And then another thing that I looked up was at first it was looking like you were doing SIGs, that's copper, indium, gallium, diselenide type of thin film. And then there was a big announcement, it looks like, or at least I read it on PV Magazine, that you're getting into pervoscite. Do you want to let us know what's going on there? Sure, sure. So. You know, the interesting story is that Ascent actually started as a research lab at Martin Marietta, aerospace prime contractor, back in the 1990s. And through time and through different transformations, the company was spun out and taken public in 2006. So SIGS, as you identified, C-I-G-S, is a photovoltaic technology that's over 40 years old. It's a technology that many have tried to develop to commercial scale and either have faltered at the costs that it has taken to develop this capability or the surviving companies were acquired by Chinese entities. And that has really left Ascent as one of the sole surviving SIGS-based thin film manufacturers outside of China. It's an interesting technology where we take a polyamide substrate, coat that substrate, that plastic substrate with molybdenum, and then apply these serial layers of copper, indium, gallium, and selenide onto that molybdenum-backed base. And when exposed to sunlight, it creates current. And this has been a technology that's been around for some time. The origins of it were really to provide a lightweight solar technology for satellites back in the Martin Marietta days. And we've had quite a bit of success over the years with sales of product to the military, to the Department of Defense, multiple space-based applications. We were on the space station for NASA for some number of months. We are a material of choice for the Japanese space agency, JAXA. We've been deployed on high-altitude airships. We're deployed on the tops of wings of UAVs, of drones, to provide additional airtime. And the reason is that this material produces electricity and the material itself is featherweight. And so we like to talk about thin film solar as a solar solution for places where rigid panels won't work. 
right? And we're all familiar with the deployment of rigid panel silicon-based solar. We see them on rooftops. We see them in fields. We see them in grid-scale deployments in the middle of the desert and what have you. But there are many, many, many places and locations on Earth where there simply isn't the space or the opportunity or the building codes or the weather to support these heavy rigid panel deployments. And that's where thin film solar creates an entirely new category of solar material because it can be laminated with an adhesive backing and you then have a peel and stick type of deployment that can go right onto the top of a vehicle or the roof of a house without destroying or a building without destroying the architectural integrity of that building. It can be laminated into the curtain walls of a skyscraper. It can be laid between the rails of a high-speed railway line. There are all kinds of places as we look for more and more ways to deploy solar that thin film gives you an answer where a rigid panel simply because of its fragility, because of its susceptibility to damage, to vibration, so forth, the weight of it simply make it a less desirable alternative. Do you know about unisolar? I know they were around about 15 years ago. They had some peel and stick solar. They kind of reminded me of yours, but it was a different technology. It was not very efficient. Yeah. And I think they went out of business without going bankrupt. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's been a very expensive path. You know, Ascent has invested and reinvested over the years, you know, in the region of $400 million in the development of this technology. And so we have proprietary manufacturing uh, capability, equipment, manufacturing equipment that we designed and had built for us and really have an extensive IP and patent portfolio around this SIGS-based thin film. In your question just now, you did refer to an announcement we issued recently regarding taking our manufacturing facility in Thornton, Colorado, and converting that to a center of excellence for perovskite innovation. Perovskites are a class of minerals that have proven to be highly efficient as photovoltaic materials converting sunlight into power. The interesting thing about perovskites is that they are inexpensive to manufacture and they carry with them the ability to literally double the efficiency of a SIGS-based solar cell. Right. So if one had a solar cell, a six base solar cell of 12 percent efficiency, adding a dual layer where we add a layer of perovskite to that would take our efficiency up over 20 percent. Awesome. So it's a holy grail right now in PV development. And the challenge and the reason that we've taken this step is that perovskites are very, very easy to grow in a laboratory type environment and very challenging to develop in an industrial scale manufacturing environment. And the way that you create a perovskite is really kind of cool. You create a mineral soup where you mix a, a range of minerals and frankly, the elements that you use in your soup the ingredients, if you will, depending on the ratios and the amounts relatively that you use will give you a final product that is optimized for different kinds of environments. So that's kind of a cool thing is that you can customize the solar material for your use case. And so the way that you build these is you create this soup, you apply it to whatever your foundation is. It could be glass. People use glass or stainless steel. A flexible backing is the most challenging. And then you evaporate the water out of that soup. And what you're left with is a thin film that is a PV conductor absorber. And what we find around the world is research laboratories, universities, even private companies are able to grow and demonstrate these perovskite materials in very, very small, small sample kinds of environments, 
something the size of your thumbnail, something the size of a post-it note. And that's as large as they can get with their equipment. What we have in our Colorado facility is the spin coaters and all of the manufacturing equipment that we've used for developing thin film SIGs. And we're repurposing that equipment to produce thin film perovskite on an industrial scale. And it's an exciting challenge. It's one that we're confident we're going to be successful at. We have a terrific engineering team. We have a very, very deep materials and chemistry and manufacturing heritage and profile among our engineers and our scientists. And we've got the equipment. You know, the thing that's so differentiating here is this is equipment that if a lab wanted to go out and replicate it, right, build and secure the equipment to do what we're going to do at the scale we're going to do it, it had cost them $30 million just for the equipment and probably a year and a half till they could take delivery. And we have it here up and validated and ready to go. So we're really excited about how this is going to accelerate this transition. We call it from lab to fab of this material. You know, I kind of have a pointer for you. Have you ever heard of the Inflation Reduction Act? You might want to look into that. There's some manufacturing stuff going on. I I heard that there's a lot of money floating around. Um, Yeah. I heard there's a lot of money floating around for this kind of thing. Yeah, no, indeed. Yeah, so there's going to be a lot of activity. I mean, you just keep reading stories about that all the time. Mm -hmm. So look into that. Another thing about perovskite is I remember years ago, I think even a couple of times, I've gone to different conferences. I go to a lot of conferences and this one in Shanghai called SNCC. And there's a guy named Martin Green. Do you know who he is? He Love him. I don't know him personally. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He works a lot with perovskite these days, and he was a crystalline guy. And I know he combines them together and layers and things like that. So when you're talking about putting them together, is that what you're going to be doing? Is putting SIGs with perovskite in different layers, catching different wavelengths? And Yeah. That's one of the projects in the pipeline is a dual layer. SIGS perovskite hybrid. And the interesting thing is, as you may be aware, the SIGS material converts light at the red end of the spectrum, and Mm -hmm. perovskites convert light at the blue end of the spectrum. When you put them together, you get that full spectrum conversion, which is why the efficiency goes up. Great. That's awesome. And so I know with thin film, but I like to educate people. That's kind of what I do. Mm -hmm. And with thin film, you get a better temperature coefficient. So as it gets hotter, which it always does when the sun's out, you don't lose as much. And so you're working more at the nameplate of the PV module. And then another thing is you catch a different part of the spectrum. So your catch, like when they test PV modules, it's always on a bright sunny day. And your conditions, they call it standard test conditions, thousand watts per square meter and all that stuff. One and a half air mass spectrum of light. And with thin film, it works better when it's cloudy. I can remember one time that they had the permanent energy, had the solar decathlon and one team won because it was like a cloudy day and they had thin film. They're only allowed to have so many kilowatts. So those are some big selling points for thin film. And then you're not having to deal, I guess, you know, getting the silicon and the refined silicon for places where labor practices are sometimes beyond questionable. We could just say putting it nicely. Well, well, you know, there's another element too. And, you know, the temporality of politics aside, I think your listeners are probably aware, maybe aware that China, which really owns the supply chain for silicon panels, has recently threatened to restrict access or restrict the use of their patents and IP, as well as supply chain elements for silicon-based rigid panels. Ascent owns 100% of its IP and supply chain. So the thin film material that we produce is unencumbered by those geopolitical issues and concerns to which you've alluded. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's kind of funny when you say that they want to keep their IP, so their intellectual property, but wasn't crystalline silicon pretty much invented in the United States? <laughs> yeah, but then when you sell your IP to the highest bidder, uh-huh. yeah. it goes elsewhere, uh-huh. you know? And that's yeah. sadly what we did when we outsourced manufacturing and engineering activities in prior decades. So what kind of applications are we looking at? Other undeveloped opportunities for your type of solar? 
Well, you know, as I said earlier, I like to think of it as solar for any location where a rigid panel doesn't work. And I'll give you some examples. I just came back from a trip to APAC, Asia Pacific, the sort of Taiwan, Korea, Japan area. And, you know, Taiwan in particular is a country that has mandated the conversion to clean energy, right? By 2030, all manufacturers in the country have to be 100% clean tech in their energy consumption. By 2050, the country as a whole, its power has to be clean tech. And so when you find yourself in countries, as we see in that part of the world, and as we're starting to see now with legislation coming out of the EU, when there's legislation driving this conversion, people start taking it seriously. Yeah. And what that means is these countries need to extract solar power from every location that they possibly can. And if you think about the size, the weight, the bracing, everything else that goes along with a rigid panel, there are plenty of places to put that material, but there's plenty of places where it won't work, right? I highlighted this idea of laying it between the rails of a high-speed bullet train. That's a real opportunity in the market right now. Can't do it with a rigid panel. We have a customer, a client for our materials that is an agrivoltaic company. And what they've done, which is very, very clever, is they take our thin film material, one meter in length by about six inches in width and roll it up almost like a cigarette paper stick it inside a glass tube that looks like a fluorescent tube that we'd be familiar with, cap the ends, put those end caps in series, and then suspend these glass tubes, high tensile tubes that have PV material inside them as a pergola over an agricultural field. What this does, they elevate it 15 feet up, five meters up in the air. You can drive tractors underneath it. You can graze livestock underneath it. You can grow crops underneath it. It provides some shade to the crops in an era of changing climate and more scorching summers. It reduces evaporation, but it allows rainwater to filter through and down to the fields. So what you get in a situation like that with their deployments is agricultural fields that are 100% available for agriculture and 100% available to produce solar. When you're in a land constricted environment, that's a total win because the alternative is you take a field, you take a rice paddy out of production to do solar. You take a grazing field out of production to do solar. And that's disruptive to culture. It's disruptive to communities. It's disruptive to a farming ecosystem and agricultural self-reliance for some of these countries. But when you use the thin film in this pergola type environment, you get the best of both worlds. So I've seen this kind of innovation really starting to take place in places other than the US And I think they're the early adopters, to be honest. In the U.S., we have the luxury of almost unlimited space, almost unlimited Mm -hmm. space. So we haven't come up against the fact that, okay, we're out of space to put rigid panels. Now what do we do? And then are you going to also try to use them like for maybe rigid applications or sometimes people I've seen were trying to stick solar on top of membrane roofs, like just commercial roofs. You might find a roof that can't take the weight of a normal Oh, absolutely. No, that's, we see that right now. You know, we can point to installations in the Netherlands, for example, where this thin film laminated with an adhesive back and a UV resistant coating simply gets applied to a membrane roof and off you go. You maintain the architectural integrity of the building, as well as the physical integrity of the building, you know, in areas where there are, again, hurricanes, typhoons, other high wind sort of situations, rigid panels just aren't a thing. Whereas if what you're doing is adhering this material directly to the roofing, directly to the sidewall, directly to an exterior wall, you don't have that issue of the thing becoming airborne in a typhoon type of situation. 
Great. Yeah. And so thin film, as you know, it's made a lot differently than crystalline silicon PV. Yeah. And crystalline silicon PV, you know, one of the problems with it is it takes a lot of energy to refine the silicon. It's like you essentially have to vaporize rocks yeah. to get that to work. And so one of the complaints about it, and some people exaggerate that complaint, <laughs> that they say that, you know, it's like, you're never going to make as much energy as it took to make it. You know, that's totally crazy, you know, but maybe it takes a year or something like that. How does it work with your thin film that you're doing compared to crystalline silicon PV? Like how much energy does it take to make a kilowatt or a megawatt or a watt or something like that, maybe? Yeah, I don't have that information to hand. But what I would say is, you know, one of the considerations that one should make when thinking about what is the energy that it takes to make these materials, remember that China is bringing online a new coal-fired power plant every week, and that largely industry in that country is using power that comes from coal plants. And right there, you have questionable carbon footprint impacts. And I believe that the fact that we're producing in what is relatively a clean energy environment here in Colorado, plants and facilities in Europe as well, will have the energy that's going into the production of the thin film will not be belching coal at its origin. Yeah, and also being in Colorado there, you're right next to NREL, so you get a lot of scientists that you probably rub elbows with, I imagine, that are... Well, not only that we rub elbows with, but, you know, NREL is a great resource for finding uh, clever scientists who are either eager to collaborate or move to the private sector. And, you know, as we go forward with the perovskite research, there's a lot of resource there, not only on the innovation side, but also independent validation of our testing claims and our performance in conjunction with the folks at NREL. Great. Yeah. So another thing is like, you know, when you say thin film, everybody thinks of first solar. And I guess they're like one of the biggest solar companies in the world. If you probably like took over the last decade, you know, there's a lot of crystalline silicon companies that were going up and down. And I would think that maybe in first solar would be number one if you went decade instead of year by year. But I couldn't tell you that for sure, but it just kind of seems that way. They proved that thin film can be successful. I guess you kind of have some proof that it works. Are you manufacturing right now in the United States? We have suspended our manufacturing in the U.S. as of last week. We announced the intention to close on the acquisition of a significant SIG thin film manufacturer acquiring the, the manufacturing assets of that company in Europe, and we'll be transitioning our manufacturing to that facility, which opens us up for the perovskite research on the equipment that had been our manufacturing equipment here in the state. We looked at the relative output performance and scale of that facility that we're closing in on and said, you know, let's produce the material there and let's use this unique fabrication facility in Colorado to accelerate the industrial perovskite development. So it sounds like you're doing your turnaround CEO thing and growing the company. Well, you know, it's looking at where the strengths are, where our strengths are, where the opportunities lie. And whenever you come into an environment with fresh eyes, there's a period of time when you go, wow, you know what? We could do this and that and Mm -hmm. the other thing. And so we're using the capital that we have for strategic activities, for M&A, for acquiring manufacturing, acquiring revenue. And, you know, we're very excited to be doing what we're doing at a time when the demand for solar is only going to continue to increase. And demand for this new category of non-rigid solar is going to find more and more demand both here and abroad. Yeah, when you were talking about that agrivoltaics where they were putting in tubes, yeah. it kind of reminded me a little bit of Solyndra, which everybody misses, but you know, it was solar and tubes. I even ran into somebody that was trying to put crystalline silicon cells inside of tubes that used to work at Solyndra to kind of bring it back. It was too bad that they disappeared. A lot of people really liked them. And I think it was just, they were a victim of 
that, you know, at that time around 2008, we had the financial crisis and then China just threw a whole bunch of money and put everybody else out of business. It just kind of seemed like at that well, time, which, you know, I think this is something that I've often seen over the decades in technology innovation is timing is everything, you know, mm -hmm. timing really mm -hmm. matters. And I think that unfortunately for that company that you mentioned, there were timing elements, which were unfortunate. And when yeah. I was presented yeah. with the opportunity to come into Ascent, I looked at the fundamentals in the industry, the state of the technology, the opportunities that were out there. And I believe now even more that it is a company and that can really take advantage of where the solar industry is, where the innovation is coming from, and a rich set of assets to put to work. Great, great. So how can you help with the net zero 2050 targets with thin film solar? It was demonstrated to me on this recent trip to Asia, where I would meet with large scale industrial players, with solar resellers and installers, as well as with government industry and finance ministries. And these are all countries that have legislated either 2050 or more aggressive kinds of benchmarks. And in all of these cases, they were looking to and exploring thin film as an adjunct, as a meaningful adjunct to the traditional rigid panels that everyone thinks about. You know, it's just a class of photovoltaics that is undeveloped, is unappreciated, and is going to be massive in the coming decades. And I would say our focus is the manufacture of this material. You know, our manufacturing facilities now will put out roll-to-roll -roll material of one meter in width by one kilometer in length and do that <laughs> week after week after week, you know, 24-7 on a continuous mm -hmm. manufacturing basis. And what that delivers is a heck of a lot of material into the market. I don't claim, nor do I believe we should focus on what those end uses are of the material, but rather to deliver the highest performing, highest efficiency, highest yield material at the lowest possible price per watt and let the building industry, let the agrivoltaics industry, let the other players in the market come up with the extraordinary uses and deployments for this, in addition to this whole aerospace, satellite, UAV, airship market, where we really dominate that, that space. That kind of blows me away, a kilometer long. How come, why not two? Because <laughs> anything more than a kilometer, I can't put on my shoulder and carry uh, uh -huh. into the warehouse. Uh, we have to get you to the gym. <laughs> I wonder what the specs would be. I want to see the data sheet for that. I want to see how many amps and volts you get with a kilometer. <laughs> I think that's a lot. I think that qualifies uh -huh. as a lot. Yeah. But, you know, the interesting thing about the material is that it can be engineered into any shape that a customer requires. The voltage can be adjusted depending on the use case. You know, there's a lot of flexibility that is incumbent here. There's a company out there a luxury jewelry company that's actually laminated thin film PV into a wristwatch that retails for $3,000. And this wristwatch is solar powered and it's lovely and it's beautiful and it's elegant. And that's just another use of the same technology mm. that's going up on satellites into low earth orbit. Really cool. Yeah. Putting stuff into space, that's kind of a big deal up there, you know? You said there was stuff on the space station? Yes. We've been involved because of the origins of the company way back to the Martin Marietta days. Applications in space, applications in satellites, test materials for NASA as they explore what solar generation could be on the moon or on orbit. That's our hood. You know, that's mm -hmm. our heritage and where we've come from. And, you know, I think that was one of the things that attracted me to Ascent and attracted Ascent to me because in my prior business was an aerospace propulsion business. And so there's a lot of crossover in terms of who the players are and how one engages 
with NASA, with the DOD, and so forth. So you were in space and in solar. Yes. Yeah, there's a guy, the CEO of Alt-E. He's also in solar and space. You guys should start a club together. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I guess you could also say that about some guy named Elon, too. Yes, indeed. I guess, you know, the sun is in space, so you might as well have some solar out there. So another thing, and I know you mentioned it before, agrivoltaics, but Mm -hmm. it's just in the news all the time. Maybe you could go into that a little bit more. Agrivoltaics is a really interesting space because as we sit here today, the deployment of rigid panels in an agricultural environment is really exclusionary to the use of that environment for agriculture. When you see a field with rigid panels deployed in their support structures, it's just not possible to graze livestock. It's not possible to grow crops. It's not possible to run uh, farm equipment in that space. And the interesting thing about thin film is back to your example of Solyndra or my example of our client, a German company called Tube Solar, is that you can deploy this material in a way that allows for 100% solar generation and 100% of the agricultural land use at the same time. And there's even certain crops which benefit from this type of partial shade that the agrivoltaic materials, for example, from tube solar enable. And when you find yourself in environments, not necessarily the U.S. right now, but in these environments where land is scarce, where farmland has a scarcity element to it, What's the choice? Are you going to stop growing food or start producing solar? With these kind of solutions, you get both. And it's a terrific win-win. It's one of the areas that I think we will see the largest growth in deployments and use in the coming years. Great, great. And so when you're talking about tube solar and they take your solar, the material that you make, and they put it in a tube. So It sounds to me a little bit like making fabric or something, like you're going to make something a kilometer long, a thousand meters long, a meter wide, and then you sell rolls of it to other people and then they turn it into other things? Turn it into whatever they want to do. That's exactly right. We're not in that end use business. Mm -hmm. We're in the, we're, uh we're in the business of producing this material at scale and then delivering that to a company like this tube solar agrivoltaic company, and they go off and make their product, use it in the construction of their product, and sell and deploy it. Really consider us to be sort of a solar OEM. You know, okay, that yeah, yeah, that's really cool. So if somebody wanted to buy a solar module from you or you know something that made electricity, I don't even know if you call it a module in some of these cases. But I mean, you would electrically by the things that I do with the National Electrical Code and all that stuff. But, you know, you make this thing, it's like a big roll of something, and then you sell it to somebody else and they slice it up and cut it up, sort of like selling fabric, you know, making in some factory with these looms. And then somebody else, instead of making a shirt out of it, they'll make some flexible solar module that goes on the roof, or they'll make a tube solar that goes for agrivoltaics. Absolutely right. It's a great analogy. It's just like a completely different thing than what most people are used to. I mean, Mm -hmm. it is completely different. I've never heard of anything really like this. I mean, they do sell the cells and the wafers and all that kind of stuff, but it seems just a lot different the way that you're doing it. And it sounds pretty neat. So I can't wait to see some more of this out there. So I guess I'll have to wait a little while before I could buy some. (laughs) Well, if you've got a CubeSat satellite going into space anytime this year, we have prefabricated CubeSat solar panels that you can stick on your spacecraft. So yeah, I was thinking of doing that tomorrow. I could sell you I could sell you one of those tomorrow if you'd like. Yeah, Um, let's do it. Yeah. I'm gonna fly (laughs) up and (laughs) I'm gonna jump on my jet. I'll be over there in a couple minutes. (laughs) Yeah. So I think that what you will see from us, what the market will see from us is continued innovation and growth. But we will always feature on our website and in our communications the new ways and different ways that third parties are taking this material and deploying it to great use. That's great. So one other thing about thin film, just the name thin, kind of indicates that it doesn't take as much material. And so we don't think of crystalline silicon as being thick, you know, but compared to thin film, 
I believe it is. I mean, I'm sure there's different ways to make thin film. So is, does it take a lot less materials? People are going to have questions about like, oh, it takes, you know, things like copper, indium, gallium, selenium, and then with the perovskites, the different materials that you make the perovskites out of. Yeah. And so like people are always wondering like, oh, are we going to run out? Like people are thinking we're going to run out of lithium and silicon, which I think is, you know, not going to happen in our lifetimes. Yeah. <laughs> and so how about these other things? I mean, obviously copper, we know what copper is and yeah. we're not going to run out of copper. We've been using that for yeah. a long time. The amount of material that goes into a thin film, you know, it's, we're talking microns of thickness, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, I would show it to you, but your listeners won't be able to hear it. I mean, I can show you some of our thin film, it's thinner than a human hair, mm -hmm. right? Like how so, much thinner would it be than your typical silicon solar? Oh, vastly, cell? vastly. I mean, I'll show you, right? Because you're seeing me here, but this is a solar panel. Uh -huh. Try that and do that like with silicon. No, it's very thin. And this is actually laminated with a UV protective layer. I think mostly what you're showing me is the plastic because it's in between the plastic. I think the plastic's thicker than the active the, material. The, the, way so to like... think about, the way to think about this material, Sean, is are you familiar with those shiny birthday balloons made out of mylar? Yeah, sure. Yep. Think about that thickness. That mm -hmm. is the thickness of the raw bare modules that come off mm -hmm. of our machines. Yeah, and also like it's kind of hard for people to even know like when, once something's so thin, we can't think of it that way. Mm -hmm. Just like a normal person. It's like, it's so thin, you can't see it. You know, it's like a sheet of paper or something that's a tenth of the thickness of a sheet of paper. It's kind of hard for a normal person to comprehend that unless, you know, you just got the measurements for it or something like that. But mm -hmm. I know that thin film, it's supposed to take a whole lot less energy to make it. And there's a lot less material with it. Yes. It's, and then when you look at it really closely too, it's a lot of stripes. The stripes, interestingly enough, are laser cuts. So think mm -hmm. about that. Think about cutting or etching this material that's so thin that it's thinner than a human hair, but we're able to etch it with lasers to create those conductive fingers. It's mind-blowing technology. It's really cool stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's printed pretty much, right? Yes, it's like, that's correct. And so it's like, like you have a piece of paper, how thick is the ink? Maybe that's the way to put yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly the way to think about it. That's exactly the way to think about it. Yep. Yeah. So, and as far as getting the materials, then it's not very expensive because you're not getting a whole lot of stuff, a lot of material. You're a lot less likely to run out of it. So, yeah, it's also good just to educate people about thin film too. Mm -hmm. So it's been around for a long time and it sounds like it's going to be around for a lot longer time because we have a turnaround CEO here making sure that that happens. <laughs> So Jeff, I also noticed from your bio that you're an avid skier, a surfer, and a sailor, mm. and you breed Danish warm blood sport horses that have been selected for the U.S. Olympic equestrian team. I have a couple of things in common with you because, well, I'm a skier, but I haven't done a whole lot of it lately. Not much of a surfer, I got, but I'm a skateboarder. Are you? <laughs> I'm a yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was just doing 360s the other day. <laughs> oh, fantastic! Fantastic. <laughs> You know, with a name like Sean White, you have to know how to do something like that. You know? Yeah, something. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Uh -huh. And I have a Ranger 33 sailboat in the San Francisco Bay. <clears throat> oh, fantastic. Next time I'm out there, I'd love to go sailing with you. During COVID, I got so bored with COVID, two buddies and I decided to go sailing. So we sailed from Portugal to Panama. And that was a terrific break from lockdown. Uh -huh. That was I'd my idea of lockdown. That. Yeah. Yeah. That's something I just dream of. It just seems like there's too much work going on to do something like that. So maybe you had a good internet connection. <laughs> In fact, I did. I rigged the boat with a satellite communications rig and I was doing Zoom calls all the way across the Atlantic from the middle of the Atlantic. Zoom. Uh -huh. Crazy, crazy. <laughs> I'm going to figure that out. When I first started working for HeatSpring, where I do my online training, and that's like mm -hmm. one of my jobs, but it's turned out to be really good because of COVID. And when he asked me to be a trainer, I said, well, can I be on a sailboat sailing around the world and work for you and do this? And he said, yeah, you sure can. And I said, sign me up. And so it was one of the best decisions I ever made. But then I get so busy and I don't have time to do that. Plus, I have an eight-year-old daughter that I can't just take off from. <laughs> but 10 more years, she's going to be an adult. So 
I'm looking there. forward to going on some long sailing trips. There and, you go. But in the meantime, yeah, for sure, come out, check out my Ranger 33, and we'll take you under the Golden Gate Bridge. Wonderful. Love it. And then also another thing that we have in common is horses. And so I grew up on this homestead that's been in the family since the 1850s. And so we've had horses there constantly since. And so I have two horses. I'm not fancy about horses. You know, I know they're geldings. Just love them. Yeah. <laughs> and we try to get them that don't go too fast because we don't want them to throw my mom or my daughter. <laughs> but I'm actually looking for some more. So when you get your horses, when they get a little bit old, you can let me know and I'll buy them off you. Well, I tell you what, these warm bloods, they're terrific athletes and they live to be about 24, 25 is a nice old age. I have a mare that this year will be 34. Wow. Yeah. That's like some longevity there. She must be taking a lot of those anti-aging medicines. You know, she takes NAD plus and she watches uh, what she eats. Uh, and Just yeah. like me. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, like we have some expensive horse food too for our elderly horses and mm -hmm. they have glucosamine in there and yep, everything. Yep. NAD plus though, that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> good for you. All right. We've also found in the legislation, which is live now in APAC and Europe, particularly with dense population centers, you know, the rigid solar deployments are pretty full. And what that leaves is certain buildings, certain industrial areas, vehicles, transportation, all of these venues, I'll call them, or potential platforms for solar that simply can't support a rigid panel. You can take a flexible, laminated, adhesive-backed thin film material and use that to generate power in locations that remain once all of the rigid panel locations are taken. So we really view it as a complementary technology to the rigid panels, not an either or. There are certain cases where those rigid panels are the right solution. There are certain cases where they're not. And when it's not the right solution, typically a flexible thin film answer can provide a solar solution in those type of environments. That's great. I like to think of myself more flexible than rigid too. And I imagine you're that way also, so, <laughs> all right. Thanks for listening to Sean White's Solar and Energy Storage Podcast. To find out more about Jeff, you can look him up at, hey, Jeff, how do they find out more about you? Come to find out about Ascent at www.ascentsolar.com. And if you want to get more solar education and learn more about these things, we even talk about rigid subjects in my classes. And you can go to solar, S-E-A-N, that's solarshawn.com, over and out.